Over the past 35 years, the world steel production more than doubled. China, from a small player, developed into a dominant producer and led to the super cycle of the iron ore industry. In this short video, I'm going to visualize the dramatic changes and explain key drivers. In this graph, each bubble is a country. The size of bubbles is population. I use the x-axis to show GDP per capita and y-axis to show steel production per capita. Our first story is the rise of China. As there are too many bubbles in the graph, we focus only on few countries. We use the US, Japan, Germany to represent developed countries, Brazil and Mexico to represent mid-income countries, and of course we have China. At the starting year of 1980, there is a strong correlation between steel production and economic power. Countries with higher GDP produced more steel. And then the world started to change. You see, developed countries were moving slowly as their growth stagnated in the early 1980 recession. In the meantime, in China, after the reform and opening up policy, the country started to catch up in terms of both economic development and steel production. And in mid-income countries like Brazil and Mexico, they were growing their economies, but their steel production didn't see an equivalent rise as their growth was driven more by consumption, not investment. Moving to 1990, China's economic development accelerated after Premier Zhu Rongji, who has a strong finance background, launched hardline reforms which revitalized the country's state-owned companies. But steel production increased at a slower pace. Now China's steel production is at the same level as mid-income countries. Will it stop to grow? The answer is no, because the new Premier Wen Jiabao took office. Premier Wen studied geology in university. He loves iron ore and steel making. So China's economy became more commodity intensive during that period. And then in 2007, most bubbles moved down after the global financial crisis. But China's fortune in US stimulus continued to support its commodity demand. And now China's steel production per capita has reached the level of developed countries. And a slowdown inevitably happened in the past two years. And then our second story is about the future. India and ASEAN region are the two most promising economies after China's soft landing. So what growth path did they experience and does it tell anything about the future? So we leave China, India and the ASEAN region in the graph. And now here we go. From year 1980, both India and ASEAN started to take off from low levels. ASEAN countries became richer first before producing more steel because their long coastline makes steel imports easier than India. Compared to ASEAN, India was moving in both directions as their large and dispersed domestic population need more steel mills to support infrastructure construction. And then in the late 1980s, some large steel mills were built in Indonesia and Malaysia as these countries realized that it makes more economic sense to recycle domestic scrap themselves instead of selling scrap to Japan and buying steel back. Then came the Southeast Asia financial crisis. Steel industry suffered a significant setback in the region, but in India, steel production was not affected due to huge domestic demand and less reliant on export. Moving into the new century, the ASEAN steel industry recovered, but then the global financial crisis hit the market. Moreover, since 2010, after the signing of China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, many steel mills in the region shut down due to strong competition from China. Now we come to the world today. Looking to the future, India's steel production is likely to keep pace with its economic development following China and its own historical path thanks to its huge domestic demand. But ASEAN production faces more uncertainties due to the openness of its economies. 